Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Aram, Aram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, Ahaz fathered Hezekiah, Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Amon, Amon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Then after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Salathiel, Salathiel fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Abiud, Abiud fathered Eliakim, Eliakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Akim, Akim fathered Eliud, Eliud fathered Eleazar, Eleazar fathered Mathen, Mathen fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dan, thank me later that you didn't have to read. No. <laughs> Uh, the outline's there on the other side, and that's the map of where we're going to go. Uh, one of the really great delights about Christmas, and in fact I think one of the non-negotiables, especially in our culture, is that Christmas is all about family. Our families gather together, even at this moment, families are packing cars and driving. And there is much good about family gathered together, isn't there? Uh, when you can sit down at a meal and catch up, you can renew and restore relationships around good tucker and relaxing in the afternoon, you can enjoy those closest to you being back together. There can be pain though too, can't there? There can be pain as the family gathers due to severed relationships or perhaps the absence of a loved one through distance or death. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about this this week. I can't really put my finger on why family has become so synonymous with Christmas. Perhaps because at Christmas we remember a family that is so small and isolated, so small and threatened. Whatever the reason, family matters at Christmas. And when you look at Matthew's biography of Jesus and you see his introduction, you realise that at the first Christmas, at the birth of Jesus, this family really mattered, and we're going to look at that tonight. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thanks that it's living and active. Our Father, we might not think it, but if we pause and consider, it's still remarkably relevant today, uh, relevant across every generation as we gather with our families, as we look forward to seeing people we have not seen for a long time, as we miss loved ones. Help us to look at the first family gathered at the first Christmas and to learn your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm um, at point two on the outline. Uh, all families have histories, don't they? Uh, some of us are proud of our family histories. Uh, some of us not so proud, aren't we? Uh, some of us are willing to talk about our family histories. Some of us want to hide our family histories. This family is defined by history. And that history is in the first verse the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, we've got to remember, this is all quite unfamiliar to us, isn't it? Even all of those names, quite unfamiliar. But in Matthew's time, as Matthew laid that line down, and as his first readers read it, there was a lot of collective cultural memory. I remember when I first moved to Weewal, and on one of my first Sundays, a bloke who became a dear friend of mine pulled me aside and said, Bernard, whatever you say... I'm related to them, I'm married to them, and I know them. There's a collective memory in We War, isn't there? A collective cultural memory, that's the case with Matthew's readers. So when they read that first line, there are a whole lot of triggers for them. 
a whole lot of cultural memories that are brought up. Uh, you know what it'll be like over Christmas, families gathered, you'll see people you haven't seen for a long time and you only need to say, remember when? And the whole family remembers that particular incident. Might be funny, might be embarrassing. It might be one you wish you'd forget, but everyone has a collective memory. Matthew has picked up on that. And it's all connected to one bloke and his name is Jesus. Do you see how he describes Jesus there in the first verse? He describes him as Christ. It's not a surname and it's not a swear word. It's actually a job description. It's a title given to Jesus because God had picked him for a job. It's used a number of times in the Bible for a person that God set aside, anointed or appointed to do a special job for God. In this case, it's a fairly big job. It's to save the world. And it's a job that carries the two promises that immediately follow, Jesus Christ, the son of David. Uh, This was a reading that Dan brought us from 2 Samuel 7. David was the greatest king of God's people, Israel. He's not the greatest because he's great, if you know what I mean. He's the greatest because of the promise God gave him. If you listen carefully to what Dan was saying, God said that through David's family tree, God would raise up the greatest king the world had ever seen. A king who ruled not because he wanted to get a bigger bank account or fame or gain, but a king who would bring peace and security for the world. He'd be from David's family, but be called God's son. And he'd rule forever. Now, I've never been a king. I'd aspire to it. It'd be a great job, I reckon. But I reckon there are a number of barriers you've got to overcome to be a king. This king has a massive barrier to overcome. Uh, It's the barrier called sin. The fact that people want to have nothing to do with God. And dealing with that barrier comes within the context of another promise that follows closely on. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That was the other reading that Dan gave us from Genesis 12. Abraham was the father of God's family. David was from Abraham's family. Abraham was great just like David, not because he was a good bloke, but because of what God promised him. If you listen carefully to what Dan read in Genesis 12, God made a commitment to Abraham at the very point when Abraham wanted to have nothing to do with God, when Abraham didn't have a family, when Abraham didn't even have the prospect of a family. God said, Through your family, Abraham, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to deal with human sin. The very basic human nature that says we can do life without God. In fact, I'm better at being God than God is. And through Abraham's family, God said he would deal with that big problem. So as Matthew kicks off his biography of Jesus... He wants us to pick up on the collective family history. The history of a job description and a family tree that promises great salvation to the world. And if you're going to put that together, you'd want a pretty impressive family tree, wouldn't you? Something that's memorable. Something that takes the best DNA from human nature. And the family tree is impressive but for a completely different reason. I'm at point three on the outline. Matthew gives us a really stylized family tree. He organizes it into a series of 14 generations and they cover the great parts of the history of God's people from Abraham the first through to the great King David, from great King David through to when God's people lost their land because they didn't trust God, then from that exile to the birth of Jesus. But it's not an impressive family tree. If you look there on that side of your sheet where the Bible reading is, there are plenty of familiar names. But do you know the nature of these men? Look there, verse 2, Abraham. Abraham's the patriarch, the father of God's mob, and when God talked to him, he was an idol-worshipping pagan who wanted nothing to do with God. His son Isaac, well, Isaac tore his own family apart because he played favourites with his kids. And then Isaac had a boy called Jacob, Jacob was the kind of guy in the office who always gets ahead by lying and deceiving, stepping on the heads of others to get up the ladder. Uh, Jacob had a boy called Judah, 
A Judah's just a weak man who can't keep his word, who fails in all of his family obligations. And then you go down a little further to that bloke called David, there in verse 6, the greatest king. Well, he was an adulterer, a murderer, who abused his position of power and was a proud liar. He had a boy called Solomon, who we know for being the wisest man in the world, but he also had hundreds of concubines and led God's people away from God. Then you go down to a bloke called Ahaz. Ahaz was the leader at a really terrible time for God's people. He ignored God and trusted in his own political alliances. Then you get down to Manasseh there in verse 10. Uh, Manasseh's description in the Bible is as the most evil king ever of God's people. Imagine finding them in Ancestry.com in your family tree. They're a bunch of rogues. They're criminals. And then alongside all of those rogues, you have the unusual feature of five women. Now, women weren't normally included in a Middle Eastern family tree, and that in itself speaks that this is a different kind of family tree. And let me just take you through them. Uh, You go there to Tamar in verse 3. She was a Canaanite who slept with her father-in-law because he'd failed in his family duties. And then you go down to Rahab in verse 5. She was a prostitute from Jericho. Go down to Ruth. She was a Moabitess, a nation renowned in the Middle East for their sexual immorality, who was a widow and a refugee in the nation of Israel. You go down a little further to verse 6 and you find Uriah's wife. Her name's Bathsheba. She's a Hittite. She had an affair with David and David murdered her husband. And then you go down to Mary. And in our day and age... Mary was a pregnant teenage fiancé. Four foreigners, none of whom had anything to do with God's people, five women who are all tarred with a reputation that you don't want, none of them with a wholesome reputation that you would expect in the family tree of the saviour of the world. What a family tree. You've got a whole bunch of men who are ugly and then you've got women who would have been regarded as beyond the pale in the Middle East. Well, why would God put such a family tree together? Well, it speaks something about God. God's actually interested in normal people. God doesn't want people who are on pedestals. God's not interested in people who are trumpet their own niceness or goodness. God's just interested in normal, sin-stained, sin-bound humans, people like you and me. And when we get a family tree like that, we actually get a glimpse at the nature of God, the grace of God, the God who'll shower undeserved kindness and care on those who've rebelled against him. The very same grace that grabbed Abraham, the very same grace that grabbed David, nothing to recommend those men except God's kindness. The very same grace creates a family tree for Jesus, the saviour of the world, That includes liars, abusers, adulterers, murderers, socially disadvantaged and the isolated. And it reveals the heart of God and the heart of God's family. It's a heart of kindness to those who don't deserve it, a grace that grabs them, changes them and reforms them, all because of his generosity. And that family tree has one aim and one focus. It's there in the last verse, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14, from David until the exile to Babylon, 14, from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, 14. That family tree is focused on one thing and one thing only, the coming of the Saviour of the world to show God's grace to any person. Just look at the first family gathered at the first Christmas. Family and Christmas go hand in hand. I'm at the last point on the outline. But perhaps not for the reasons we often think. Matthew kicks off his biography of Jesus showing Jesus' family gathered truthfully and historically for the first Christmas. And it gives us a number of thoughtful prods, at least three. They're there on your outline. The first is Jesus' family tree gives us great hope. When we read verses like this, 
I think we should be given great hope, great confidence because of this kind of family tree. And it comes from Jesus' family history of promises. God always does exactly as he says. Through Abraham's family, I'm going to save the world. Through David's family, I'm going to create a king who will rule forever. And he will save the world. God does exactly as he promises. God is good for what I, whatever he says. It never changes. And it happens in real time and space. Real people, real world, real problems. There's a lot of hope spouted at Christmas. The hope that emerges when somehow we get all of our family to sit down at the table together and give each other gifts. That kind of hope disappears as soon as you've eaten too much or drunk too much. It won't last. The hope offered by Jesus' family tree is nothing like that. Look how many generations it's lasted. And still people gather to listen to it. Second, Jesus' family tree gives us great comfort and confidence. I think sometimes when we get all the family around the dinner table, we breathe a great sigh of relief and go, look, things can turn out all right, at least for one moon. But when we gather with Jesus' family like this, we're actually given comfort and confidence beyond anything we can imagine. You see, when we read that family tree, when we read those promises and meet this family, we realise that God's grace is sufficient for any person. God's grace is immense and massive beyond anything we can understand and it's publicly displayed. There is no sin. There is no rebellion. There is no immorality. There is no character flaw. There is no skin colour beyond the grace of God. And that grace is available in Jesus Christ. And to put it bluntly, this is the father who never, ever gives up on his family. And he always pursues them. The comfort lies in the truth that no one's beyond God's grace. And the confidence lies in the truth that any person by God's grace can be included in God's family tree. But thirdly, Jesus' family tree is confronting it confronts our preconceptions about Christmas and family. Would we be delighted by these kind of people sitting at our dinner table at Christmas? Would we invite relatives like this to our family gathering? It confronts our own ideas about Christmas. God wants people like this at his dinner table. It confronts our understanding of what Christmas is all about. God displays grace when so much of the Christmas displayed in our world is. And it confronts our own understanding of God. Have you ever thought of God like this? A God being pleased with such a family tree because it shows his grace? A God who always keeps his promises even to sending his own son to save the world? a family tree that we would find, frankly, embarrassing, but God finds sufficient. It's going to be good to sit with family at Christmas. Don't hear me wrong. It's going to be a great delight. There'll be things that we despair of as we miss family members. But as we sit with our family at Christmas, please remember that first family gathered at the first Christmas and its revelation of God's great grace. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for this family tree. Uh, it, it is a surprising family tree. Uh, it's not one that we would have designed, but it's one we're familiar with as we see people just like us, normal people who are damaged by sin. Father, thank you for your goodness in putting this family tree together for your son so we can see your heart and desire, your grace. Thank you that it is available to any person by trusting in what you have done to bring them into your family through Jesus. Thank you for your family at Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.